I'm Kari Rowe. I'm Meredith. And you're listening to the Foreign Saints podcast, the pulse check for those of us that die daily. And uh, it's been a while since uh, since Meredith's been on, but she has something she is burning to bring to the people <laughs> this week. Um, hey, you might as well get you might as well get right into it, man. Like, mm-hmm. what is on your heart and soul <laughs> for the people? Yeah. So. This has been kind of an itch for over a year at this point. A really long time. A really long time is the idea of the default parent and just everything about it. It gives me the ick Um, from start to finish. I have yet to see a positive fruit to come out of it, to be honest. No, that's right. Right. But But you got 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 to let the people know know, what it is. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. So the idea of the default parent, I don't know if it stemmed from her or if she's just the one that's kind of coined the phrase, made it her own viral thing. Uh, It's off of like the mom podcast. Her name's Renee. And it's this idea that the mom stayed home, whether she's a stay at home mom or a working mom is like the default parent that takes care of all of the child rearing tasks exclusively. You know, and that if dad is involved, dad is only fun or only around for like minutes, you know, whether that's, you know, emotionally around or physically around a bit of both, however you want to word it. Um, And pretty much it's just the all of the things that come with raising kids is exclusively mom's thing. And she she'll, you know, go ad nauseum about all the different things. Like, you know, not just, you know, feeding, but also the mental load of, um, you know, what all do we need to have in the back in our diaper bag before we go out for the day or um, keeping track of allergies and uh, medical history or um, preferences, how they like to have their their sandwiches prepared, you know, all of those things, whether important or, you know, meaningful but not crucial things that just moms have on their radar that dads don't. And pretty much she pitches it in in a way on her platform that builds resentment towards her husband and ergo her audience's husbands. Um, Because at first I was introduced to this idea when Amari was like weeks old (laughs) in the trenches of postpartum and all of the wackadoodle stuff that comes with it with the hormones and for us we'll share in a minute just like with our personal stories with that first year postpartum and just the heaviness that came with all of that stuff um and I remember my knee-jerk reaction was like oh yeah I'm doing all of this stuff you know he's not around blah blah blah. and then I realized I was like I don't think I've had a positive thought about my husband the more I think and the more I like am consumed by this girl's content And then I started reading the comments and I realized I wasn't alone in this idea that although this idea of the default parent has gained a lot of traction in recent years, there's also been a counter, which is really encouraging to me um, from other mom content creators of just, no, I mean, it's a joy to raise our kids. And there's certain things that we're, you know, these creators being Christian and non-Christian, oh, get us out of breath pregnant lungs, Um, you know, there's going to be things that biologically (laughs) are going to weigh more on (laughs) mom, like speaking of, speaking of, you know, like the physical toll of being pregnant and carrying and birthing. And, you know, if breastfeeding, you know, feeding the kid for the first year out of the womb, right. You know, there's, there's going to be those things that come to mind. You know, if you're a stay at home mom, it's in your job description. Yeah. To do the things that... It is in the name. Yeah. Yeah. It is in the name. You know, the, all those things, you know, knowing how to fix their PB&J just the way they like it with the right ratios, with or without the crust or, you know, cut in squares or triangles, you know, those are meaningful things that you're pouring into your kid to show that you recognize and you care, um, care about not just, you know, their physical needs, but their emotional needs. And those that should be a joy as a mom to be able to like cultivate that in the home again whether stay at home or working um and those are just things that are a natural overflow of the mom's role you know or this the wife's role but specifically mom here yeah you know and, um at least from 
from my perspective, or at least just to, if nothing else, just give you a breather. <laughs> um, should mention, because I have, I have uploaded quite a few episodes uh, since the last time you've been on. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, this is Meredith Rowe, my wife. Hey. Um, passionate about points, uh, just like me. Um, so, yeah, she jumps in every now and again. This is uh, another one of those episodes that is um, definitely, definitely kind of push forward, just kind of like a passion on her end. But I've definitely seen it on my end, just in talks with coworkers. Um, at the hospital, I remember one day, like it's not multiple days, but I remember one day in particular where, you know, there's this one guy and then this other lady that was having this eh, uh, impassioned mm-hmm. debate, mm-hmm. Um, conversation <laughs> um, on this whole idea of which parent does more uh, which parent is more important. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that all y'all listening can already hear the foolishness Mm -hmm. in a premise like that. Right. Because they both surprise, surprise, Mm -hmm. were able to pull up statistics that showed that kids did better with with both. both. (laughs) Right. But because that wasn't the question, the question for them was who's more important. Mm -hmm. They're trying to see which uh, dumpster fire, just mom or just dad Mm -hmm. is less of a dumpster fire yeah, and therefore claim victory Mm -hmm. or whatever. And then naturally, you know, I kind of get roped into it because, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good thing, you know, it's like resident Christian in the workplace. And people take that seriously. So, of course, you know, sometimes my opinion is desired. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's like, oh, you know, hopefully you studied because, mm-hmm. um, you know, your number's being called again. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I remember what I said to them was like, dude, me and my wife, we, we, we don't play that game. Yeah. And they're like, you know, and of course, the, you know, the lady is like, okay, but like, but like she does do more of the household stuff. Right. And I'm like. Girl, I am here with you in this ICU for at least 12 hours of the day. Right. So. I would think she's doing more. I I, I don't, unless I'm the flash and can run home (laughs) in between rounds and do this, I I would assume. And even even if that scenario were true, I still think she's probably doing more. Mm -hmm. Like, what kind of question is that? Yeah. Of course. What do you hope to like? Because there's because there's obviously something beyond mm-hmm. just the obvious is the sky blue mm-hmm. kind of question. Mm-hmm. Huh? Is the parent that's home mm-hmm. doing more of the with child work? Oh, mm-hmm. man, that's a difficult one. We got to bring up statistics to answer that one. Yeah. And something going back to that podcast that really struck me recently was, you know, because there's been a growing pushback to this idea. I would say in recent weeks, you know, I would say there was another, I forget her name and I did not save the reel on my phone to be able to reference it now, but she did one where um, it was kind of like a response to this idea that she's kind of made viral, Renee's made viral of, you know, yeah, I am the default parent, but you know, who's the default provider? Not me. You know, who's the default provider who's going to bust his butt at his job working overtime you know, so that way I can stay home and be, we have at least one parent that's involved in the nitty gritty of making our house a home. You know, mm-hmm. he's the default, you know, heavy lifter. He's the default project finisher, finisher around the house. Like he's the default and just fill in the blanks of all the things that her husband did to like lift up and honor her husband. And I thought it was a beautiful response of like, kind of to my point of why I think this is just a hurtful and sneaky way that the enemy builds um, wedges in couples is this idea of like, you have to one up, you know, your husband. And I was telling you earlier, like this or vice versa or vice versa, you know, but especially for me, like the, with it being a mom thing, like, because if you, you know, it kind of feeds off of this idea of like, well, Am I worth anything if I'm not contributing financially? Am I worth anything if I don't have a college career or any or a college degree or a career or fill in the blank, you know? And it's like this idea that, you know, feminism really fuels of you have to be equal or better 
than men, you know, but this idea of like, we just don't value the little things, <laughs> you know, there's that. And there's also just this idea of. It's like that verse in the Old Testament, right? Don't despise the day of small things. Yeah. You know, like the, the mindset of the default parent trap is to mm -hmm. get you to despise every small thing. All of it, you know, and it should be a joy to know that you are involved in your kid's life that way, whether you're a working mom or stay-at-home mom, you know, that, yeah, your brain, you know, is hardwired towards your kid, like biologically, you know, like there's certain things, you know, all of my mom friends will agree that like, we respond to a baby, our baby's crying faster than our husbands. That doesn't mean <laughs> that our husbands are calloused or they don't care about the baby's cry, but there's just like a biological hardwiring for us that like you can't stand it. It causes like anxiety, especially in the newborn years and especially if you're breastfeeding because of the way that God designed us to respond to our kids. I don't know. That's tough language right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, bringing up design, aka. Yeah biology yeah really that i don't know man that's that's tough waters bro yeah but it's i think in again seeing that growing pushback was encouraging for me that yeah okay <laughs> secular or not like people see like just just like the biological <clears throat> design we're going to talk a little bit more about the biblical one here but just the societal like society doesn't work <laughs> Right. If we have to say that men and women are equal in every single facet of life, they have to do the same things in every facet of life to have equal value. In the same amounts. In the same amounts, same to the same amount degree. Of time. All of it, you know. And my thing is, you know, I guess now would be we can kind of pivot to like the first year of Amari's life of just like when we were in the trenches last year having that mentality would ruin us and yeah. this have to have this tit for tat you know for context like you were working pretty much full-time hours as an emt doing clinicals in med school finishing out your senior year of med school i was working two jobs remotely with a newborn <laughs> while juggling all of the night feeds and i had a lot of issues with breastfeeding that caused a lot of um really dark thoughts that aren't normal with breastfeeding and directly correlated to breastfeeding. And all of that was against the backdrop of having been, uh, having been betrayed mm -hmm. by like literally, well, not everyone, but all the people that like ran the mm -hmm. ministry that we were a part of, right. um, you know, just having been wrongfully, uh, excommunicated and dealing with the fallout from that mm -hmm. um you know trying to pick up our pieces trying to uh help other people that were displaced yeah. by everything that went on with that ministry that felt like they found a home there mm -hmm. and all of a sudden now that's gone mm -hmm. um so i mean there was there was a lot going on and a lot you could say i guess that was against us and then also just a lot that was tough yeah and not to say that there weren't like brief moments where that was considered, but it never became like the bedrock of how we looked at our yeah. day. And I feel like for me, it was usually in like the extremes of sleep deprivation that it hit the most, which is why I say like, this is totally of the enemy and I can't be convinced otherwise because it is just perfect fuel for that resentment that is just naturally embedded in us that you know you have to one up your yeah. your, your other person like you know like i remember there was one night because i was doing all the night feeds because you're working night shift most nights or right. driving to and from clinicals that were hours away like you were very rarely home and it, you know there was one night where i was like i'm doing everything you know i'm breastfeeding around the clock i'm changing all the diapers you know i'm busting my butt he's not doing anything blah, blah blah and i remember finding this girl on my feed and i just remember it just fueled it like i was so mad at you for providing <laughs> <laughs> like if you had to put it in context like i was so mad the fact that you were busting your butt so we could keep a roof over our house or keep a roof over our heads you mean i mean like what i just remember like i was going to bed and it just smacked me in the face like this conviction from the holy spirit like hello yeah, <laughs> yeah. hello uh that is not what's like, happening here it's like, like it's... if he were you know 
like it's completely different if say you know your husband comes home after a long day and he's just very standoffish doesn't even say hello doesn't greet the kids you know and just like sure it's completely disconnected right you know i would still ask some questions like you know did he experience some kind of severe trauma at work that's a valid question you know, something happened during his day that maybe you should probe about before you accuse him of being callous and heartless. Right. Maybe there's, you know, there's context to everything here, but like, if that's just a norm that he's just disconnected, that's a different conversation than what we're having here. You know, this woman on her podcast will talk about how like the video that went viral was pretty much, she was saying her husband works in healthcare long stressful hours oh see yeah i didn't know that yeah i didn't know that just and for context y'all i don't ask for clarification a lot of times <laughs> on like meredith's topics so that way you get my uh, fresh vitriol and so wow. you know Healthcare, she huh? this video she's that went viral that i saw in the, in the trenches of this you know i'm like my husband works in healthcare and he's gone long hours you know <laughs> and she has this like little <laughs> video where she's explaining you know she's role playing with her kids toys you know like spider-man gets to go to work all day and you know live up to his passions and he gets to listen to a podcast that's on his way nuts. home that's on nuts, his way home I, from work i just finished spider-man too bro that's the that's for, for y'all that know that's <laughs> oh that scream boss fight is what that is <laughs> right and and um you know and then whatever the other action figure was it was like the whatever and um you know, stayed at home. And that's her job all day is like to take care of the home and the kid, you know, or whatever other project she's working on, you know, and then, you know, he gets to come home and he just puts his feet up and he doesn't, um, his job ends the moment he walks in the door. Her job doesn't stop until she goes to bed. Blah, 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 you know, pretty much saying that, like, as soon as he walks in the door, they need to be doing like equal share. You know, and she like then switched her turn once she started getting a little bit of pushback on this. She switched it to like equal parenting, you know, yeah. where then it then it turns into this tit for tat, you know, where, OK, so now when he comes home, we really do need to count how many diapers I change compared to you and how many meals that I prepare compared to you and how many times I put away the dishes compared to you and all these things in order to be equal parents. I'm like, listen, yeah, I don't remember uh, what his job really is in weird. healthcare, but um. He sees people die <laughs> every day or keeps them from dying or, you know, has to do procedures that would make most people like crawl in their skin. You know, like the idea of what he does at work any day, regardless of what his position is. <laughs> I just remember being like flabbergasted because I think it was humbling too. like you came home a couple of days later talking about working a code in the middle of the woods on a drug addict, you know, oh, yeah, like two in the that. morning, the weather was yeah. awful and you come home all disheveled and you're like, Hey, I want to hold him. And I'm saying like, why, why would you want to what? And then it dawned on me. I was like, it is an idiot to listen to this woman and her ideas because like, <laughs> he not only is he like working a job outside the home for long hours while in school, He's working a stressful job outside. So this idea of like, you know, Spider-Man comes home from his hospital job and gets to listen to his wonderful podcast on the way home. I'm like, I don't know if that's the break that you think it is, ma'am. Yeah, <laughs> like, actually, uh, I'm like, I, I just, just, <laughs> just, just to stroll down memory lane, right? I, 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 I do remember that day. Yeah. Uh, at least if I've got the one in mind that you're talking about. Because there's probably about. more than one at this point. There are a lot. And on, a year, so. <laughs> like they come in batches so like if there was one code that day uh mm -hmm. again for y'all that don't know code uh cardiac arrest mm -hmm. right heart stop cpr mm -hmm. all nine um with probably some fentanyl and some mm -hmm. other stuff in there just, and then just there were drugs involved just for, if i remember just, like, just for good spices you yeah know I mean? you know <laughs> gotta add some flavor there got to man but... you know have a nice little code with a nice mm -hmm. little uh hint of thank you note oh you know goodness. like that's that's what you need right yeah. So, yeah, I remember that day. Yeah, I remember that. We just had to pull off to the side of the road because it was like this, uh, these like homeless cats mm -hmm. that were just like off. You know, like y'all that live in North Carolina, like in rural areas, like you're driving and there's like a, just forest mm -hmm. on either side of the highway. They were like like 30 yards off into the into woods. Into the woods, yeah. And then you know, thing. like like just past this intersection. So, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, we get out, you know, we check all the stuff over there. And like the lady is like... Yeah, I just woke up, turned over, and he was blue, so I called 911. Yeah. And, 
yeah, that was the that was the situation. So I mean, it's just it's one of those things where it's like I don't know. Like yeah. I remember because I know like and and some days some days it's just tough. Mm-hmm. Like like even on days off, you don't like days off aren't always days off Mm -hmm. like you're not there but it might still be with you like i've Mm -hmm. had i have had some and i usually just shake it off you know it's like i just kind of okay it's expected Mm -hmm. um or i usually will like talk about it on our like in our wednesday night bible study Mm -hmm. like the church Mm -hmm. is definitely how i have prevented ptsd from having a shot at cropping up but yeah no there, there are some mornings there are some mornings where you'll wake up and it's like almost like the hint of a dream fading away from your mind. And it's just like the face of some like six month old baby that you did CPR on that you lost yeah. or like the face of some lady who's like mangled in some car accident, like that you don't forgot about. You didn't, mm-hmm. you weren't messed up when you ran the call. You weren't messed up after you did yeah. the call, but it's, it's just, with you. yeah, it's just, you know what I mean? So like, yeah, there are some, but you know what? You didn't do the dishes when you got home. So <laughs> You're on the couch. Right. <laughs> like, right. You right. didn't sweep me off my feet. Right. And, you know, do the dishes and then do bath time with Amari and pack your own lunch for tomorrow. And right. To do it all over again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, like. Within within 12, like, within these yeah. 12 hour shifts. They're back to back so, most of the like, time. You just come home. Yeah. You sleep. You wake up and you do it again. You do so, it like, again. Yeah. So, if you didn't process what happened that day, mm-hmm. that's cool. You just. Bottle it yeah. up. And you just add it to the pile up. for the next. Like, so this idea of like, I have to, you know, keep score, which that just doesn't sound appealing. That sounds exhausting. It sounds really exhausting. It's it like Pharisee exhausting. Sabbath stuff, count my steps. Right. That kind of nonsense, you know? And so this idea, like, I remember from, like from that moment, that realization of like, this is some, this is some bull. Right. <laughs> like, right, right, right. absolutely not, not worth my time and not worth my emotional energy, you know, and um, just really start praying, like, how do I outdo him in honor, you know, right, right? Instead of how do I, you know, make him feel the pain that he's already feeling about not being home right. with his kid, you know, because right. that's the other side of this is that we don't talk about the sacrifices from the husband's perspective, right? you know, because I remember there was one time we were like, I'm missing a lot, all of this, you know, his first year, you know, like I remember you came home and you were like, I, you know, I missed his, you know, this first, this, and this first, this, and there's a sacrifice that the husband makes more often than not about, you know, being able to provide means you're going to miss a lot of milestones for your kid. You know, like how many times in the last few months alone, even after we've been removed from this stressful season of like the first year of Amari's life. Right. Um, and kind of in a season of releasing that pressure valve yeah. of that first year, yeah. right? You know, well, how many times well, recently- I'm gonna miss I'm gonna miss his first Christmas. Yeah. Like I'm on like I'm well, on that day. But yeah. Oh, we'll see. Yeah. Oh, there <laughs> right. it is. There no. it is. There it <laughs> right. is. I missed the first Christmas yeah. actually. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just the this idea of like how many times in the last few weeks I've been like, oh my gosh, he started saying this or he started signing this or he's really interested in this now. He loves to play this game. Yeah. You know, like but you're at work, you know? And it's like, that's a sacrifice that you're making for our flourishing as a family, right. you know? But we don't talk about that because that means that we would have to recognize that we're not the only women, we're, like the moms are not the only people sacrificing in the relationship. Well, I you mean, know? that's, that's kind of why I referenced, uh, kind of why I referenced Spider-Man 2 on PS5. Mm-hmm. Sounds so weird to say PS5 now. Um, freaking old, dude. Nerd. Freaking old, man. Nerd. Remember when it was PS2, dude? But yeah, like, I mean, you can say nerd, but there's a good chance that at least half the people listening know what I'm talking about. Um, just you based on... So you they get the reference. No, just, just, based, just based on, like, statistics uh-huh. and, like, video game sales. Like, uh-huh. if you got a title sell, you know, like, tens of millions of copies borderlining on, like, a six-figure amount, mm-hmm. that's a lot of people. It is it's not like it's not like one dude buying like 300 million <laughs> copies of a game. Like, I don't it's, know. It's a lot of people to play. Fanboys exist. But, it's but like, anyways, was was wild though is like even the stories we tell, we know this crap is crap. Right. Like that's what was so amazing to me about again y'all that don't know just keep up. All right. <laughs> 
Oh, that was so amazing about the boss fight between Peter and Mary Jane. Spoiler alert. Um, yeah, because <laughs> she got... That's a late spoiler alert there, but she okay. gets the, If y'all didn't know that was coming, that's y'all's fault. Um, but yeah, no, like, she gets the symbiote on her, becomes Scream, and, like, all the stuff that she's spitting out under influence of the symbiote is literally this episode. Mm-hmm. Like... This, I'm like, I'm like, it's freaking crazy, dog. I'm like, some of y'all men definitely had flashbacks that y'all didn't want mm-hmm. and did not expect when y'all was playing that. But yeah. she, she was spitting some facts, bro. Yeah. She was like, she was like, I do this work that I hate to serve you. Mm-hmm. Like, I pay the mortgage while you're out Spider Manning all that. And I'm like, I mean, facts. Mm-hmm. But like, you're trying to kill him. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe, like, you know what yeah. I mean? And you know, she's under the influence of a symbiote, which is, um. For y'all not in the know, is just an alien demonic force, basically. I was gonna say it's an alien demon, like it's an alien demon. Yeah. So, like, so in the story, right? All the stuff that's like these strong female talking points. And this one thing is funny: people that push back against feminism have pushed back against that game, thinking that they've made Mary Jane some like huge feminist character because of that mm-hmm. rant. And what they miss is that. In the game, she's mm-hmm. only saying that rant because she's under the influence of uh, a literal yeah. alien demon from space. Mm-hmm. So I think the story is saying that this sort of rhetoric right. is usually from darkness, not light. Right. And the big triumph is, you know, they get the symbiote off and they're like, okay, look, there were some things that we both had to work through, but like, we forgive each other mm-hmm. and we will move forward mm-hmm. as a team because yeah. we're a team and I believe in you and you believe in me and rah, 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 go get them tiger. Yeah. Right. Like, and everybody I have ever watched on YouTube play through that part is like, I am moved emotionally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like all the men are like, I want a lady like MJ. Like that mm-hmm. was fantastic. You know what I mean? Like, it moves us mm-hmm. to see that sort of thing because it's so real. Right. Like, we all know what it's like to be tempted with that idea of right. I'm doing everything, but we also know instinctively how false it is, right. which is why, believer or non-believer, everybody that played that game, freaking standing ovation mm-hmm. at Mary Jane, like, not listening to that nonsense because mm-hmm. we know it's nonsense. Mm-hmm. And it's so easy for me now, like, you know, because that – first year of his life was so brutal. Like I, you know, I've kind of instilled it in my head, you know, that I'm not looking forward to the newborn stage again here in a few weeks. But at the same time, I have to remind myself like, well, first and foremost, we're not in the same season or the same we're place. Not. We're not. This you know, uh, we are in a much better spot. We have Praise. health insurance. <laughs> this time. Yeah. Oh, amongst so many other things that God has blessed us with, but. Two minute warning. Um, I know, but I like saying it. Really? Um, but just this idea of, like, I fall back into that of, oh, it's going to be all on me again. You know, if I breastfeed, I'm going to be up every hour and a half for at minimum 30 minutes to feed the baby. That's probably not going to latch well because I'm already didn't latch well. I have a bond. Yeah. You know, I'll go on this whole thing, you know, and I'm like, oh, the physical recovery sucks and it takes months and – you know, and I start going to this what was me pity party instead of being like, hey, we're about to have like another kid here soon. That's pretty exciting. That's you pretty know? dope. And like today, especially just like soaking in like, man, Amari is so big now. Like he looks like a full like child, child, not a baby. Like he's not even two, but like he doesn't look like a baby anymore. You know, and it kind of breaks my heart because I'm like, man, that first yeah. year I kind of like didn't soak it in, you know, the the way I should have. Yeah. You know, cause I was swept up with all the emotions and just the stress of life instead of just being like, nah, this whole motherhood thing is pretty, pretty great. You know? And on that note, uh, we're coming into, um, you know, last minute here, um, in the back half of this episode after the intermission, is when we're going to actually crack open the scripture. Yeah. Um, talk about the similarities between stay-at-home moms and the Levitical priesthood. Say what? I know. I know. I'm a nerd. I just sit in this. I, mean, I just <laughs> see thematic connections. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, got an intermission coming up. Hope you all enjoy it. And we will be right back with the show. God is moving in Uzbekistan. 
A group of women in rural Uzbekistan have become effective church planters since coming to know Christ, but their faith has come at a cost. Two of the women were rejected by their families and kicked out of their homes. The Christians now go door to door, inviting other women to join them in reading and learning about the Bible. After several years of faithful work, the women have established several church groups. Though Uzbekistan has long been a highly restricted country to Christianity, its government has made incremental reforms in religious freedom in recent years. This improvement with unity among believers across several Christian denominations and a focus on training and equipping Christian leaders is a positive development for the small number of Uzbek churches and Christians. Though restrictions on churches and Christian organizations have eased, evangelism and conversion are opposed, and it is still illegal to distribute evangelistic literature in public. 83% of Uzbeks are Sunni Muslims, 2% are Christians, including a small fraction of 1% who are evangelicals. Many are irreligious as a result of suffering under decades of atheistic communist rule prior to the fall of the Soviet Union. The government finds Christian converts from Islam and families often reject family members who become Christians. Converts from Islam are persecuted by their families, communities, and sometimes by the government. Evangelical Christians are considered religious extremists and have been fined and detained for holding worship services, which the government sometimes considers to be illegal religious activity. Orthodox churches meet openly and illegal and legally, but most evangelical Christians meet in unregistered groups. Uzbekistan's government once routinely imprisoned Christians, but fines and short detentions have since become more common. Bibles are difficult to obtain and, for some Christians, risky to own. Voice of the Martyrs distributes Christian literature and equips pastors and evangelists with ministry tools that expand their outreach and other ministry work. Pray for the Christians in Uzbekistan. Uh, For that 1% in 2% that's out there doing work, pray that their labor would be fruitful. Uh, Pray that they would continue to do what Jesus has commanded uh, each of us to do, uh, despite, um, in spite of all the opposition. And pray for you and us as well, that in remembering their chains, that we would go forward to break chains in our own culture with the message of the gospel that saves people from their sin, that introduces them to the living God and makes them foreigners in this world as well. And now back to the show. All right. Welcome back to the show. Hope you enjoy the intermission and hopefully I'll figure out what intermission I want to put there <laughs> after I'm this. There yet. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Like I said, I mentioned last episode to them that, uh, that's the last thing that's recorded. So they'll hear it in a way before I actually record it. So I can't have like a, a bridge. A, yeah. Like yeah. I can't bridge it in a way that like mm-hmm. connects to what I was. Yeah. Tough uh, content king problems right here. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, just as far as uh, what I was talking about last time, just like the similarities between the Levitical priesthood and the trad housewife. <laughs> um, <clears throat> to set the stage before we go there, because we're going to be going to First Chronicles chapter nine, um, you know, from a bibliophiles out there. Um, but first, we're starting in Titus chapter two, um, one of those epistles of Paul that feminists hate. I think because they're not letting the Old Testament be their interpretive key for the New Testament, which is the only interpretive key that actually makes any sense. Seeing as who wrote Titus? Paul. Paul the Apostle, who was Pharisee of Pharisees. Bakari, he became a believer. Yeah. And do you think he stopped being, being a, a Pharisee? Pharisee yeah. Like, no, he was he was he was a Pharisee that was righteous by faith. Mm-hmm. Right? He, he's what a Pharisee was supposed to be. It's actually interesting when you read Paul and you're like, dang, that was just one of these guys? Yeah. Like that was like the amount of wealth that came out of a Pharisee who actually bent the knee to Christ properly is your New Testament. Um, I don't know. It just makes me wonder, you know, like what, uh, you know, what could have been, uh, you know, and I guess what will be when mm-hmm. Israel returns. But um, yeah, so much of 
the misunderstandings of Paul have to do with the fact that y'all just ain't reading the Old Testament <laughs> like Paul did. You know, surprise, surprise, maybe Paul understands the Old Testament better than you. Uh, you. Call back to um, the verse by verse study in Matthew where he said the same thing about Matthew. Surprise, surprise, maybe Matthew. Maybe all the New Testament authors just understood the Old Testament better than you. Mm. And maybe that's why some of the things they say don't make a lot of sense to you because you don't even understand the imagery that they're pulling from and building off of. But Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 1, but as for you, right, Paul instructing Titus on how to teach and how to lead, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, <sighs> kind, <laughs> and submissive to their own husbands. <sighs> Double A. Double, triple ick, that the word of God may not be reviled. Um, likewise, uh, oh, never mind, stop there. Um, but just something that I was pointing out to you, Meredith, was note the differences and similarities mm. between what Paul says to say to the older men and to the older women so many of the things right because you know feminists and stuff are not a fan of passages like this that talk about oh gosh is that talking about being submissive to a man i could never see the bible is patriarchal and mm -hmm. women are called this uber submissive role and just to be slaves and whoa you're you're taking off on a runway that i don't even think is paved mm -hmm. like this is you are you are pulling a lot out of here. I mean, this is this is grade A gaslighting, aka eisegesis. <laughs> um, this is crazy because that's not what I read here. That's what you heard. Um, but yeah, some of the things that he says to the older women are things that you would expect in a culture like ours mm. to have been attached to the men, right? It is to the women and not the men that he says. Um, where is it at here? Uh, that they need to teach what is good. Oh, right. Teaching being talked about in reference to the older women, not the older men. That's not my way of saying that the older men weren't supposed to teach. I'm just mm -hmm. saying it's not what you would expect yeah. if you're coming at this with the pre-programmed lens that culture would have you come to the text with. Um, yeah, like there's just so much, like there's so much here. Um, they're to teach what is good and so train the young women. Okay, train. I know y'all don't like the word, but that's kind of a big word, mm -hmm. right? Like training is, that, that's a big word. So we got teaching, we have training. Interesting, Yeah. right? And then there's a couple other words in here that just made me, this is me personally, made me think of the priesthood in the Old Testament, right? Reverent mm -hmm. in behavior, right? When I, at least this is what I said to Meredith almost verbatim, when I think reverent, I think reverence, mm -hmm. I think awe, I think worship. And that, at least to me, just brings a priestly image to my mind. And then you talk about teaching. Okay, now we're starting to fill in this image of priest. Then you also have pure, self-controlled, mm -hmm. things that are usually tagged on to ministers of the gospel and you know healthy prophets um and all of this uh paul says that the word of god may not be reviled right not that the women would be in subjection that's not the ultimate goal here the ultimate goal is that the faith would not be put down would not be looked down on in the eyes of unbelievers and even in the eyes of those within the body Right? And again, I'm like, and what happens when priests don't teach what is good, don't live pure lives, aren't self-controlled and aren't reverent in their behavior? The word of God is reviled by church and non-believer alike. Right? So, I mean, these are just some of the thematic connections that I just kind of saw, you know, a while back when I was in Titus. I was like, huh, 
And this is kind of it makes me yeah. think of the Levitical priesthood. Not to say that the Levitical priesthood is a type for the housewife. I don't. <laughs> he said, no, no, That's no, a stretch. no. The Levitical priesthood is a type for Christ. Right. Um, you know, they offer sacrifices. Christ offered one. Mm-hmm. They die, so they cannot always intercede for you. Um, but Christ lives forever. Thereby, his endless life itself is constant intercession for you in that way. The priests are symbolic pictures of Christ. But I think pictures can function in multiple ways. And mm-hmm. I think God's artistic enough to pull that off and not break his own canon to pieces. Yeah. Um so yeah, you know, just saying, I see something here. And so coming over to First Chronicles 9, uh, and again, the reason that I'm kind of walking through this is just to show you another way of looking at the role of housewife, mm-hmm. of stay-at-home mom, right? Because we live in a culture that, like Meredith said, is going to program you or do their best to program you into the matrix of this mug is slavery, it mm-hmm. is subjection, there's nothing honorable here, it's just a bunch of low tasks that have, aren't valuable to the yeah. world in any way, shape, or form. There's nothing that is yours anymore. Like, you don't have any title besides your kids. Right. You know? So, ergo, your only value is in your kids, which, that that's that I would argue is sinful, because that's an idolatry issue. Right. But... You know, the flip side, too, is it's also wrong from the flip side because, no, you are worth more as a child of God. Right. You know, and we don't talk about that. Right. We, we'd rather talk about what was me. What was me? I change diapers and make bottles all day. I mean, but even there, like, you see the attack on the gospel, right? When it's mm-hmm. like, oh, so my identity is just lost in serving. And I'm like, what do you think it means to be a Christian no matter the gender? Right. Right? Like, are you just telling me that my identity is supposed to be be swallowed up in Christ? Yes. Mm-hmm. That's, yes. That's just Colossians 3. Your identity is hidden with Christ in God. Right? You want to know who you are now post new birth? Get to know Jesus mm-hmm. and you'll get to know yourself. Like, that's, yeah. that's just what this is. So there's a certain level where at its core, like, you're just being programmed to reject the very foundation that leads to gospel maturity, which is my, like, I need to decrease that Christ might increase in me. Mm -hmm. Right. And how that is, how that, you know, touches every aspect of your life to include parenting. But, you know, like, again, you know, I guess this default parent trap is exactly that. Don't let that mentality of, decreasing and letting Christ increase. Don't let mm-hmm. that infect your parenting, says the world, because right. then you'll decrease in your parenting. You need to find a way to increase in your parenting. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to find a way to increase your name, your fame, your renown, mm-hmm. right, in your parenting or else you will be lost. Mm-hmm. That is that is the bait. That is what's being said. And Jesus' response to that is those that cling to their life will lose it. So you need to learn how to kill that part of you because yeah. that part of you is going to kill you if yeah. you keep listening to it. Um, but not just that. You got to replace it with what the truth actually is. Yeah. Um, you know, so to that end, First Chronicles chapter 9, starting in verse 17. Uh, if you're listening and you have the opportunity, I always advise having a Bible or a Bible app handy. It makes the listening easier. If not, then uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, <laughs> I, I bounce, okay? That's uh-huh. just, that's the other reason I say that. Um, so that way you can hold your place uh, should I lose it. Uh-huh. Um, verse 17, the gatekeepers were. Now, this passage in First Chronicles chapter 9 is detailing some of the Levites as they've kind of been uh, formed and reformed and their, some of their duties in the temple. Um, so I'll draw some things out as we go. Uh, the gatekeepers were Shalom, Akub, Talman, Ahiman, and their kinsmen. Shalom was the chief. Until then, they were in the king's gate on the east side as the gatekeepers of the camps of the Levites. Shalom, the son of Kor, uh, son of Ebiasaph, son of Korah, and his kinsmen of his father's house, 
The Korahites were in charge of the work of the service, keepers of the thresholds of the tent. Now, one thing I do want you to notice is how domestic, mm -hmm. how domesticated yeah. you could say this description. Sleep in the floor. Right, right. Do literally. The dishes. Literally. This mug sounds domestic. Um, <clears throat> keepers of the thresholds of the tent, as their fathers had been in charge of the camp of the Lord, keepers of the entrance. And Phineas, the son of Eliezer, keep that one in mind, mm -hmm. was the chief officer over them in time past. The son of Eliezer, what is Eliezer? was the chief officer over them in time past. Well, you have you have fun with that. You want to pod too, <laughs> bro? Let the people know. Bro. Like the name when you break it down is the helper. Right. Yeah. Like the help of God. Yeah. Ezer. Ezer is help. Help. Yeah. And that's right. And L is and L, L yeah. right? That E L is mm -hmm. God, right? With the in between with I. So it's God's help, help of God, mm -hmm. right? That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. The yeah. son of the help of God, of God's mm -hmm. helper. Yeah. Is working in service of the temple. That'll mm -hmm. uh that'll be important here. Um Zechariah, the son of uh dang, this is this one is a tough name. Meshalamiah? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Meshalamiah. Wow. <laughs> uh, was gatekeeper at the entrance of the tent of meeting. All these who were chosen as gatekeepers at the thresholds were 212. They were enrolled by genealogies in their villages. David and Samuel the seer established them in their office of trust. So they and their sons were in charge of the gates of the house of the Lord. That is the house of the tent as guards. All right. That is as manly as a description as you're going to get of these guys. Mm. After this, about to get mad domesticated in here, bro. The gatekeepers are on the four sides, east, west, north, and south. And their kinsmen who were in their villages were obligated to come in every seven days in turn to be with these. For the four chief gatekeepers who were Levites were entrusted to be over the chamber and the treasures of the house of God. Note that. They're entrusted over the chambers and the treasures. That sounds legit, but I mean... Like, that's housewife stuff, bro. Mm -hmm. You're in charge of the insides and the money. I mean, Meredith, that's just about... <laughs> hey, that's, that's just a... That's my job description. You know? <laughs> Verse 27, And they lodged around the house of God, for on them lay the duty of watching, and they had charge of opening it every morning. So, <clears throat> what you're saying is... I can't just live where I want to live. Mm -hmm. You're telling me I have to live if I'm a Levite, if I'm a Levite in this cohort of Levites. I have to live close to the house of God and I have to be up early. At, at ungodly hour. To, <laughs> to get the doors open, to yeah. be ready to work. Yeah. 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 They had charge of opening it every morning. It gets even more domesticated. Uh, verse 28. Some of them had charge of the utensils of service, for they were required to count them when they were brought in and taken out. Others of them were appointed over the furniture and over all the holy utensils, also over the fine flour, the wine, the oil, the incense, and the spices. Um, these Levites sound kind of barefoot in the kitchen a little bit. <laughs> Like, there's a little bit here, bro. Mm -hmm. Others of the sons of the priests prepared the mixing of the spices. And Mattathiah, one of the Levites, the firstborn of Shalom the Korahite, was entrusted with making the flat cakes. Other translations word it in a way that I like more for my point. Um, they say that Shalom the Korahite was uh, in charge of all things baked in the pan. <laughs> is like literally how some translations uh, will render it. Um, also, some of their kinsmen of the court of the Kohathites had charge of the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. Right now, I know long section of scripture, boo, and it was Old Testament and it was kind of genealogy, double boo. But there's a lot there. What okay, does it have to do with being a default parent, dude. Because the Levites, in a sense, were the default parents of the temple, bro. Yeah. Like they're the ones doing all the work. From morning 
to sundown mm-hmm. and again mm-hmm. they're the ones doing all the domestic roles you could say of the temple and more than that right meredith tell the people um what did the tribe of levi not get that the other 11 tribes did get from god land 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 so what you're saying is they were just as excited to taste of the promised land and enjoy the promised land while in egypt and while in the wilderness as all the other israelites Mm -hmm. But once they come into the promised land, then God tells them, yeah, but you guys, Mm -hmm. you guys won't get a piece of it. Yeah. What? What? So like, Rescued from Egypt? You need to tell me that I busted my butt to start a career, go to grad school, and now you want me to stay home and wipe butts and make PB&Js. Or to translate it into Levitical terms, you rescued me from slavery to Egypt, had me go through the wilderness, had me help out with the conquering of the land and all that. And you're saying that I, a Levite, don't get to have a portion and inheritance in that land. Mm -hmm. And God's like, yep, but I will give you something better. (laughs) Oh, better. Oh, well, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Isn't that interesting? We're okay with God not, quote, unquote, not (laughs) doing something if our flesh is Uh interesting. But what God says, I'm going to give you something better than land. I'm going to give you the job of serving in the temple. Yeah. That's actually better than getting a land inheritance. Question, how many Levites do you think really believe that? <laughs> I'm certain there were some who were excited, maybe most, but I can't imagine it was all of them, certainly not instantly, as all their fellow Israelites are out enjoying their new vineyard or yeah. you know, planting their crops and getting their generational wealth started, right? <laughs> The Levites aren't doing any of that. They're in the temple and scattered throughout the 11 tribes, um, working synagogues or stuff like that as, you know, people that work to keep the holiness in all the other tribes. Huh. That's tough. That's tough. And at least for me, like, I can't help but see a parallel, right? Like, Like, God's called you to a life of service, speaking specifically you know, like housewives, he's called everybody to a life of service. Mm-hmm. But in the case of a housewife, especially so, mm-hmm. in a way that's like, I guess, obvious to the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the Levites, you could be looking at the rest of your kinsmen in a way, right? Doing all these big and bad things. And it's like, you don't even realize that God's given you a better thing mm-hmm. than literally all of that. Yeah. Like you get to work in a place closely related to the birthing of new life Mm -hmm. in people in the case of levites spiritually in the case of mothers physically and hopefully spiritually too hopefully Mm -hmm. both right right like hopefully you get to see both and right saw you born and saw you born again Mm -hmm. that's got to be pretty cool yeah to know that you had such a big hand in that Right? Like, I get jazzed just if I hand a track to somebody and they get saved. That'd be a whole nother level of excitement if it was like, I poured blood, sweat, and tears into you, mm-hmm. and you finally meet Jesus. The level of satisfaction there right. has got to be one that I've never experienced, despite how many people I personally may have introduced to Christ in my life. Because mm-hmm. I've never invested that level yeah. of pain yeah. into somebody's life i've just not done it but ladies get to say that they have Mm -hmm. right again but again this is coming at least for me from a mindset of i'm not competing right right yeah because that's stupid right (laughs) exhausting right john chapter four right the planter and the harvester will rejoice together yeah in that last day right so what's the point in competing oh i'm the harvester i did more work than you the the planter Mm -hmm. yeah but our work both was used of God mm-hmm. in different ways to, to bring about spiritual fruit. life. Yeah. So what do I care? Yeah. Which role? Oh, right. Cause mm-hmm. I don't like my life being identified with Christ in mm-hmm. such a way that I don't get the glory. Yeah. Right. That's, and I think I don't like that. I think too, again, now like, like looking at this default parent, Whatever you want to call it. Sure. <laughs> I just call it trap. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. This Default is a trap. parent trap. You know, looking and at that. And because it's a cool movie reference. And hey, hey, hey. For the old heads out there. Hey. 
Um, but also just the looking at like looking at this from a Christian perspective, right? As a Christian wife and stay at home mom, as like you know, like what we were saying earlier is like there, it should be a joy to serve at home, but also like what you were saying with the leaf, it's like, I'm going to give you something better, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, thinking through the lens of when I worked outside the home before Amari was born, you know, and we would host Bible studies and stuff. Like I would rush to get home. We would maybe have dinner beforehand. You know, maybe we would have like a couch to sit on that wasn't covered in laundry. Probably not. You know, um, now it's like, no, it's a joy to be able to create a space where, you know, people feel welcome and at home and like conversation is cultivated over a meal. You know, we get to break bread together in our own home that like I can f- help foster that in a way that I couldn't ha- if I was working outside the home with with or without kids, you know, yeah. not to say there's anything wrong with working outside the home, but um, that ought to be like a joy and something that you, you know, look at as a part of your day and a part of your job description as a stay at home mom. You know, that like I get to make our home a ministry hub. I get, you know, for both yeah. our our own kids, but also for others, you know, in a way that I couldn't if I was working or if I didn't look at my life like that. Yeah. You know, like if I was trying to one up you all the time, like I that would not be on my radar. Yeah. <laughs> my radar would be consumed with, well, I did a load of dishes earlier. You got to do them now. Or, I mean, it's just, you yeah. know, like the daily grind of a Levite was pretty domestic. Like, I mean, yeah. like outside of the outside of running the sacrificial system, right? Like outside of that, outside of what went on at the tent of meeting and outside of what went on at the temple sacrificially, right? Like it's it's domestic. Like, what are you doing with all those animals that are sacrificed, right? The Levites, according to what God said, because they're working in God's house, they have an equal share of the food, Mm -hmm. right? So like when someone brought a sacrifice in, right, and it was killed on the altar and it was butchered and all that, um, to use like like the deli idea of butcher, Mm -hmm. um, like the Levites could eat that. You know, the grain offerings, the Levites could eat that. Because they didn't have land. Mm -hmm. They didn't have land to work and grow their own thing. Yeah. Which means that their sustenance was, it came from the faithfulness of the people, right? Like, literally, the daily grind of a Levitical priest, if you discount the sacrificial system stuff, looked almost identical to the daily grind of an Israeli housewife in that day. Mm-hmm. up early getting the house ready to go counting the utensils making sure all the kitchen stuff is there getting the spices ready getting all that re- right like this like that's what's happening here right yeah. like if i read that specific part and didn't and just remove the names you'd be like oh it's like wife stuff right <laughs> no it's priest stuff mm-hmm. right but that's what's so cool in scripture right is For those that have eyes to see, right, scripture is not going to openly call attention to most of the thematic ties that are there because God wants seekers, right? You will be diligently rewarded for searching your Bible for truth and gems, right? Again, read it because it's inspired not to be inspired and you will be 10 times more filled. Yeah. and inspired than you would be otherwise. And this is in one of those ways, right? Where it's like, yo, like. There's this, there's this tie thematically between the work of a priest and the work of a housewife. And the cool thing, the slam dunk of all this is what the Psalms say about the entire earth and universe, that it's all God's temple. Mm-hmm. Right? Not just the temple in Jerusalem, right? That existed so that the people had something to interface with God and get, uh, you know, get forgiven and all that and to be a picture of Jesus to come it was never intended to be permanent right the whole earth is his temple right so like any housewife in the faith that's doing what she's doing for the sake of christ for the sake of the kingdom don't get it twisted you're doing a work at a priest as well so like again it's just interesting it challenges this idea that like men are supposed to be the only priests of the home Mm -hmm. if you want to argue primary i won't fight you on that But what I will say is that if you're in a Christian home, 
mom and dad are present and you don't have two priests, yeah, one in mom and in dad, you're going to be up a creek without a paddle at some point. Yeah. Right? Like, I hope mom and dad are both doing their own work for God. Are both doing their own individual assignments so that together they create something that neither one could create apart. Right. I remember when a statement like that was actually pretty beautiful. And now right. it's like, Ooh. now it's like hateful to say, yeah. are you telling me that as a woman, I can't achieve the peak femininity without masculinity? Yes, actually. Mm -hmm. Just like masculinity can't really achieve peak masculinity without femininity to be its help from god mm -hmm. right that's really what it is right i think any christian woman actually following after jesus in her marriage is an eliezer is a mm -hmm. help from god i don't think any christian man worth his salt in any capacity would should be ready and willing to admit that yeah um i think we ought to be because it's one of those things that witnesses to the world again like the foreignness of the way of christ yeah. But this mug is different. It's yeah. not just a social club we go to. You just kind of, no, like this is a way of life, dog. Yep. This is a way of life. Following after this king brings me more peace than you trying to play your one-up games. Like you guys arguing and you, you know, arguing, oh, the man is more important. Oh, the woman is more important. Meanwhile, I'm sitting over here just watching you two squabble like, Jesus, they don't even get it, bro. Like, if we want to really have a discussion on who's the most important in this relationship, it's Jesus and nobody else. When do we forget that? When do we forget that? Who's the greatest? Is it John? Is it Peter? Is it me? Is it Meredith? Jesus, it's me. And if any of you knuckleheads want to be great, you'll learn to serve like me. Because that's how you actually be great in this kingdom. But... You know, as for me, man, I hope that ministered to you guys. That's that's all I got to say. Um, Meredith is Meredith is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Meredith is happy. Uh, we have we have punched uh, this idea in the face. Yeah, I think and established a foreign way of living in the midst of this. So, um, you know, to all y'all, man, be encouraged. Serve the King, bro. Find a way to be Jesus to the body to the body around you this week, um, you know, and especially, you know, just appreciate your families a lot more than you do. Um, to that end, man, I've got to say peace.